Hey, everybody. How's it going? Good. Yeah. All right. Let's not let you fall asleep here. Um, so like Ryan said, I'm going to talk about Puppet at GitHub. Um, a lot of that's going to be centered around a thing at GitHub we kind of call chat ops. Um, kind of keybot driven stuff you'll see a little bit later. Um, so hopefully you guys find this interesting. I'm going to try to keep it fairly short. I figure with a lot of these things, most people actually want to kind of have like a free for all uh, Q&A and just like ask me questions about crazy stuff that we're doing or problems we run into. Um, so I'll probably save like 10, 15 minutes for that. Um, so hey, I'm Will Farrington. Uh, I work on the operations team at GitHub. Um, lots of other stuff there too, but primarily operations. Um, so first let's start with what, what's the state of Puppet at GitHub right now, right? Um, well, we have two, two sort of big Puppet projects. Uh, the first is Boxen. Um, we've got about a year's worth of work in on it at this point. It was started um, April of last year, so it's about a year old now. Um, we open sourced the work about three months ago. Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, Boxen is a configuration uh, system for OS X machines. It's designed at not only automating your development environment, but also automating your personal configuration. Uh, we use it at GitHub on all of our laptops, not just developers, designers, HR people, finance people, everyone runs Box in a GitHub. Um, since open sourcing, uh, we've had about 180 public modules contributed, uh, so it's been growing pretty rapidly. We've also added two external maintainers uh, from one source and Jay Halls. Uh, so these are people who don't work at GitHub who are actively full maintainers of um, the entire project. And the stack, as far as Boxen is concerned, is pretty modern. Uh, it's running Puppet 3.2. I actually just went through yesterday and tested everything with 3.2 RC2. Um, so when 3.2 launches, we'll immediately flip the switch. It'll be up on 3.2 running everything latest there. It's also masterless. Um, we intentionally design things from the beginning such that it runs um, in apply mode locally on everyone's machine uh, because a lot of people didn't want to have to depend on a network connection or a master being available um, on VPN or anything like that in order to configure their machines. It's still running Ruby 187, that's what ships with OS 10, and one of the big things we wanted to focus on uh, was making sure that Puppet runs even after the initial run were consistent. Um, and you can't really get that if you're going to, after the first run, switch to like Ruby 193, for example. Uh, you can't necessarily guarantee consistent behavior between the two. Um, it's also run manually by people, they just run it in the shell. Let's talk about the, the more important one, and that's GitHub Puppet. Um, I think GitHub is, is kind of one of a few companies in this regard that's, that's been a longtime user and supporter of Puppet, um, in that our code base is almost five years old now. Um, which is pretty old in, in the Puppet world. We're talking pre-024. Um, if you guys remember Puppet from, from those days, it was very young software, very immature software in a lot of ways, but you know we were still happy to use it and we're still sticking with it. So here's kind of what the development of our Puppet uh, repository looks like. Uh, you can see in 2010 when we did the initial build out when GitHub migrated from NGR to Rackspace, a lot of activity then, uh, that was Anchor Systems built out that uh, original version over in Australia. And you can see after the first part of 2011, it starts to taper off a little bit, and then it gets really, really busy here in 2012. And the first part of 2013 looks really, really busy too. Uh, for those of you not familiar with this graph, that's code additions on top in the green and code deletions on bottom in the red. One of the other things you can infer from this is we've been doing a lot of refactoring work recently. You'll notice that the, the depth of the, the red spice has increased dramatically. Um, which is generally a symptom of not adding new code, but rewriting old code. Commits, uh, you can see very, very quickly um, start to climb in the last year. Um, our team has grown. Uh, a year ago, it was three people. Uh, today, we've got about 12, uh, regularly uh, considered part of the operations team. Code additions is pretty much leveled off, if not dipped a little bit. Code deletions, again, spiked a good bit. Here's where it starts to get interesting, though, in my mind. Um, so this is contributions over the past year, and these are commits only on the master branch, right? So you've got Jesse on the long end here. He's running at about 2,000 commits over the last year, which, you know, commits are kind of a vague number. They don't necessarily talk about how much code was changed, how much value was added, anything like that. And then on the low end, you've got people with, with about 150 commits. But what are, where I think it really starts to, to appeal to me is that when we take out the operations team, which you'd expect, they're about the top half of the graph, they're working on it every day, 
But about a quarter of all commits in this, these top 15 committers are by people who don't work on the operations team, who don't know Puppet, <coughs> didn't know Puppet until a year ago. Um, so we have Adam Robin here, the, the first one after the red bars. He taught himself Puppet for Windows of all platforms. Uh, to build out, like we have all these build boxes for GitHub for Windows, he taught himself Puppet this year, like just in a pull request that's epic, it's like three months long, but he taught himself Puppet and automated all of that infrastructure by himself. Right? Next up, you have Ben Berger. He's the one who actually built GitHub Enterprise. Um, it, it works with Chef, right? Um, so he was a Chef guy, didn't know anything about Puppet, but he started working on our new headquarters network because we're moving offices here in July. Wrote the whole thing in Puppet, we're using a bunch of our modules from um, GitHub Puppet, Tom Self Puppet to do that. We have systems team people there, guys who build out Cassandra clusters. All these people on the, the long end here um, didn't know Puppet and have learned that a lot recently. Um, and in terms of activity, like if you're thinking on the, on the scale of a year, it's kind of hard sometimes to conceptualize like how active that is. Um, so an average week for us, we close about 50 pull requests. Um, we have about 25 issues on top of that. That amounts to about 300 commits across about 24, 25 people on a given week, uh, which is pretty good numbers considering that you know our operations team is only half half that size. Um, means we have a lot of people who aren't operations people regularly contributing to our puppet infrastructure. Um, you know, DevOps is kind of a, it's a popular term now. It's a term that a lot of people are excited about, and especially younger companies, uh, they they tend to start from the beginning with DevOps principles, and that's fantastic. But for a company that's you know five years old like GitHub is. Um, and it is a larger company, sometimes it's hard to kind of break down the wall that exists uh, between operations and development sometimes. And th this to me is it's a pretty promising sign that it does work, that people can learn Puppet, especially in an old Puppet code base. So what does the stack look like for GitHub.com's Puppet infrastructure? Well, we're running Puppet 2.7 on GitHub. Um, we actually right now have our own fork of Puppet that we maintain internally. We're working on getting some of that released out of the world. But most of what it is, is it's performance patches on Puppet 2.7. Um, our Puppet 2.7 is comparable to uh, Puppet 3 runtimes right now, um, due to some patches that Amon Gupta, TM1, has landed. Uh, he's also done some performance work recently on Puppet 3. Uh, you'll see some of his work land in uh, Puppet 3.3 when that's released. Um, one of the goals we have with this, and I, I've you know, tossed this idea around to a few people I know from Puppet Labs, is we actually want to kind of convince Puppet Labs to make a Puppet 2.8 release. Kind of similar how to Python, released Python 2.8 after Python 2.7 was declared to be the absolute last Python 2 version ever because upgrading is still a difficult process. Um, so basically what we're working on is, is getting our uh, fork to the point where it could be potentially released as a, a Puppet 2.8 candidate. Um, where it's got all performance improvements that are visible in 3, the Ruby 1.9 and Ruby 2.0 support. Um, and in addition to that, uh, very loudly complains about any deprecations. It's also running a single Puppet Master. Uh, it's a single box, 24 unicorns running the Puppet Master. That's it. Uh, it's pretty simple. Our deployment mechanism is Capistrano. That's all there is to it. Still running Ruby 187. Most of our infrastructure is either Debian Lenny or Debian Squeeze. Um, so needless to say, 1.9 is not exactly shipped by default. Um, we're looking to move to 1.9 uh, very shortly now that our fork has 1.9 uh, support. That's probably one of the next big things that we're going to go ahead and tackle. We run it via cron jobs. Um, originally this was done just on the hour, every hour. Needless to say, as you add more nodes, it breaks down very quickly. Um, so what we've done now is we actually have a uh, puppet parser function that does um, basically splay based upon a uh, hash of the hosting. Um, so that ends up with a, a pseudo-random uh, placement of jobs across minute intervals in the hour. Um, so we were able to decrease load on the Puppet Master that way, but aside from that, we keep it pretty simple. Uh, we are using PuppetDB. Um, this is a, a pretty recent change for us. Uh, our infrastructure relied a lot on exported resources. In particular, uh, all our monitoring um, is done through exported resources uh, that are collected then on the monitoring post. It's a really nice way to write manifests, but it also makes catalog compilation times pretty atrocious, especially if you're using the old active record-based um, storage mechanism. Uh, since upgrading to PuppetDB, we've noticed a pretty massive improvement uh, in catalog compilation times. In addition to that, we've also gotten some additional um, sort of uh, functionality that was hard to implement before. 
Um, so for example, you can collect run reports with PuppetDB and you can keep them for X many days. Uh, we were actually able to hook up Qbot, our uh, chapter robot, to go ahead and fetch us on demand um, entire uh, reports or subsets of reports based on time spent. Allows us to very quickly uh, look at, for example, when a given resource changed. Uh, you can do that with the PuppetDB API for the last time that service Apache 2 was restarted, for example. Uh, makes diagnosing problems that made it in production uh, pretty simple. We're still using custom node definitions. There's no ENC um, yet. Uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, most of it is done with uh, the regex uh, syntax for node definitions. So for example, um, you'll have like an FS35 pair, and we'll use a regex to go ahead and denote A side and B side of that high availability pair. So let's talk about how we write code. Um, so we do it, I think, to a degree, a little bit differently than a lot of people do. Uh, especially given how old our code base is. Uh, some of our practices are surprisingly modern and others not so much. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about is the Puppet Lab Standard Library. How many people are actively using the Standard Library? Like not just have it in their Puppet repo, but are actively using the contents of it, the functions it provides, the facts it provides. All right, so we got a couple hands up there. Um, so this is actually kind of the coolest module you could ever have in any project ever. Um, mostly because it gives you uh, a lot of beneficial things. The first one is parameter validation. Um, if, if you have, for example, a parameterized class, right, and let's say you're taking a string value for something, and what happens is, if someone goes ahead and uses your parameterized class, and they type out, say, this package parameter, right, what if instead of putting Redis2 server or Redis server, they, they mistype the server part? It fails very ungraceful, right? Just falls on its face, it's like, well, I tried to install a package that doesn't exist, which isn't exactly terribly helpful or informative about what good values are, right? With things like uh, validating on regular expressions, which is provided by uh, Puppet Lab's standard library, you can provide very informative error messages in addition to your validations to ensure that uh, catalog compilation fails if the parameters are not satisfactory, right? You can also do things like validate absolute paths, validate booleans, uh, validate strings, validate arrays, uh, just, just about anything you could want to in terms of actually validation of data uh, before um, application of resources occurs uh, is provided by the PubLab standard library module. Um, this also makes it really easy to uh, test unexpected behavior to a degree because by, by adding these validations here, uh, it becomes very apparent when you don't wall yourself off from failure conditions. You can also do data munching. Um, so one of the things that's always been really frustrating to me using Puppet is the environment parameter on the exact title. In particular, it takes an array of strings that have left side equals right side, right? Now, that's nice unless you want to actually pass this around. Um, because if you have things like uh, the same, um, what would be environment variable specified multiple times, ordering is not necessarily guaranteed. Um, so what you can do with the data munching that's built into Public Lab Standard Library, for example, is you can pass around hashes instead. You can merge hashes together, and then you can actually merge them, uh, merge the keys and the values with a given string to construct your environment that's passed later on. We use this in a bunch of places in Box and Current. You can also do resource handling, uh, at least in ways that are more effective than just the defined uh, Puppet parser function. So one of the cool things they've added is defined with params. Um, so for example, if you're doing a lot of refactoring of, of how you specify certain things, um, in the case of GitHub, this might be we have two different ways of specifying God monitoring processes, right? Um, and they might all both try to define a user God that has certain parameters. Uh, with defined with params, you can effectively uh, start working on eliminating the duplication of code, but do it from, from a, a perspective that's safe, right? So you can start with wrapping these things, with checking if they're defined with params before you can abstract things out and move to just uh, one method of doing things later on. Another fun one is uh, ensure resource. Um, so this is some actual code copy and pasted right out of Boxin, um, GitHub's Boxin, uh, because we override um, there, there's a, a, a specially patched version of Ruby um, that, that's actually R193 that we run in production for github.com uh, that's open source. You can find it at uh, github.com slash github slash um, I believe Ruby hyphen the code shop. 
Um, it's got a bunch of performance patches and things like that, but one of the interesting things about uh, doing RBM, for example, is you can't really upgrade in place a, a Ruby version with the same name. So the way we work around this here is we use a symlink and we actually have real version numbers for all the subversions of our patch version of Ruby, in this case 1.0.30. Now what we'll do is if the resource already exists in the catalog, which means that someone has included the class that installs 193p23 on TCS GitHub, we'll do an override here with our collector. Now, if that resource doesn't exist, the collector doesn't do anything. The cool thing here with ensure resource is because the collector has already been applied to the resource, if it gets to ensure resource, it will not fail with a duplicate declaration here, but instead will define it only if it does not exist. Um, so effectively, this is a really cool way to avoid a lot of the pains of um, sort of previous uh, monkey patching that, that uh, uh, you would have done in Puppet, um, doing it in a little bit safer way. And the nice thing about ensure resource is it'll fail with a uh, yeah, duplicate resource error if the parameters don't match, but the collector takes care of that. Um, another thing we do is we use uh, role classes. Um, so everything's scoped under GitHub role. And the way it works kind of top to bottom here. So we might have a node configuration that looks like this, right? So we have some Redis servers that live in Rackspace. It gets GitHub role Redis, it takes a couple of parameters. Now the role configuration is a little bit more explicit. So we have some validations to ensure that it's vagrant staging or production environment only. Uh, we check that the IPv4 is a valid IP. Um, we also use um, sort of these, these Variables that get passed around a lot. Uh, a big one for us is monitor. And that's set based upon the environment. And that gets passed to pretty much everything that's referred to in the context of the role. Like it's all top down, right? So for example, we say we have the GitHub core class, which sets up a lot of the, the base thing that every boxes have. Um, and you pass monitor to that and some parameters. You have Redis server, you pass monitor to that. Um, and as I mentioned before, what that'll actually do in the implementation of the class is uh, provide the monitoring, but in the context of the thing that is being monitored. So for example, Redis monitoring lives with the Redis definition, um, SSH monitoring lives with the SSH definition, that sort of thing. And then from there, it's further abstracted. So if we go into GitHub core, it takes a monitor parameter, includes some classes, passes monitor down to other things, disables IPv6, all sorts of stuff like that. And that goes even further down. Uh, and you'll see that, that uh, we're a big fan, uh, really, of kind of breaking things out to as many um, classes as we need. Uh, we find that it's a little bit easier to track down errors if you try not to have giant classes. Uh, you've seen that in a lot of code bases in the past. Another thing we're actually a really big user of, this is mentioned earlier today, is Augeus. Um, so for example, Redis server does a bunch of Redis configuration uh, for bind address, port, demonization, um, directory, that sort of thing. Uh, we do validations there as well, and then from there we use Augeus to, to set the values. Um, big things we use this for um, right now, uh, pseudoers entries, Redis config, MySQL config, that sort of thing. We also try to encourage a little bit of code share where possible. Right now we're doing that with Library Puppet. Uh, it's written by Rojek, as most tools in the Puppet community are these days. Um, you, should, you should really look at using that if you're not already. Project and I have also been co-writing a project together called Headset um, that's going to replace Library Puppet, uh, mostly because the backing library behind Library Puppet Librarian uh, has a lot of implicit assumptions uh, that make it not only not ideal to work with, uh, but also mean that we can't do certain things. That should be coming out hopefully this summer. So let's talk about how we deploy Puppet. First thing we want to do whenever we're committing code is we want to keep it clean. For that, we use Puppet Lint. Uh, the style guide that was referred to earlier, Puppet Lint will not only validate uh, that your code matches that style exactly, uh, but more so for a lot of common errors, it can actually rewrite the file if you ask it to. So you don't even have to go in and edit and make the changes that it's asking you to. Uh, a lot of common cases it can resolve itself, such as misaligned errors. We also want to keep it green. For that, we use RSpec Puppet. Um, RSpec Puppet allows you to write tests for your catalog compilation. It doesn't do application level tests. Um, you should really be using something more at a higher level, uh, acceptance level beyond an individual module for that sort of thing, uh, just because of the amount of interaction you have between modules. Uh, but for testing your catalog compilation, ensuring that conditionals apply uh, the way you expect, RSpec Puppet is great for that. 
for running the tests, we use uh, TM11's test QGEM. Uh, it's a lot like parallel spec and parallel tests and all that stuff. It just takes a slightly different approach. Um, and then it spins up a pool of workers and assigns tests to them. But one of the other cool things is it actually keeps a profile of every test that's run uh, across multiple runs, so it can optimize the distribution further. Um, this cut our puppet test times from around eight minutes to like less than a minute. Um, we have a lot of puppet code. Uh, and you can run it all with script CI build. The nice thing with script CI build is it'll not only install your dependencies, it'll check your syntax of not just your puppet, but also your um, Augeus lenses, your ERB templates, and any um, types, providers, library, uh, puppet parser functions, that sort of thing. Uh, it'll run your specs, and then it'll run a couple of links on all the code. Uh, before the uh, nice thing is we also have this hooked up to um, our Git uh, pre-commit hook. Um, so anytime anyone goes to run a commit, it'll actually make sure that the code passes all these things before they can commit it and push it up. We also keep the process pretty simple. As I mentioned, we have that git pre-commit hook, so it'll go ahead and yell at me here because I have some uh, poorly linted code. From there, if I push it up, uh, Hubot will automatically run CI. You see, it's down to about 47 seconds, which is pretty good. From there, I can also deploy via Hubot. That's done via Capistrano, by the way. Um, one of the interesting things here you see uh, is this is actually doing a branch deploy. Um, so for our Puppet repository, every branch on the repository becomes a Puppet environment automatically. Um, these deploys are pretty lightweight. Uh, the way it's implemented on the server is we have a uh, Barlib Puppet Git directory, which is just a full fetch of the repository, and then all of the individual environments do a lightweight clone locally um, from that uh, shared repo on disk. Um, from there, we can go ahead and invoke some of the chat ops. So for example, if I want to see the environment that some nodes are running in, I could just ask Qbot. If I want to run puppet on node, tell Qbot. If I want to know op a branch, see what it's going to look like, do it through Qbot. If I want to run a branch, can do it through Qbot too. All of the logs from all of these are going to be pasted inline in the chat room as well. You can also disable puppet runs and enable puppet runs. We can go ahead and get a last run report via the PuppetDB API for a given node. We can also get a collection of all certs that exist on the Puppet Master. You do a lot of things with Qbot. Uh, this is how we do all of our, our all of the management for all of our Puppet infrastructure. Uh, it's a really great system, and the reason for that is that it's kind of learning by doing for everyone. Um, so what will often happen, for example, if we have an outage, is we have uh, people who aren't even on the operations team just idling in the operations room just to watch how we work. And, and through that, we found that a lot of people uh, have become themselves just more capable of responding to incidents without involving operations, just because they've watched us do it. They're like, oh, that's, that's how you do it. That's really easy. I can just ask Qbot a bunch of things. Um, so we, you, know, you should really like, look into that and try it out, give it a shot. So let's talk about the future of public GitHub. We're we doing a lot here. Um, the first thing is with Boxin. Uh, something that's going to roll out soon is sort of this remember to run support. Uh, so I mentioned that Boxin's all run by hand. People just invoke the Boxin command and it runs everything and does the, the magic flags on the public command and all that stuff. Um, what we found is that some people forget to do it. Uh, so we're adding support such that um, once a week on shell load, uh, it can prompt you and say, hey, you haven't run Boxin in a while, you should probably run it and ask you if you want to run it. Now, for some people, this is of course going to be incredibly annoying. Uh, so we've made it easy to opt out. You just create a file in your home directory and it will never prompt you for those things. We're also going to be adding Puppet Master support. Um, I was talking to some people at Mozilla. They've been um, preparing to roll out Box into their organization. Uh, one of the things they wanted was a Puppet Master. So we're going to make it something that you can opt into. You don't have to run Masterless anymore, uh, which will make it easier for people to roll out updates across entire subsets of systems if they want to do those on a timeline. We're also going to be adding Hira support. Uh, this is one module at a time. Uh, a lot of the modules to date have not been written with Hira in mind. A lot of that's changing now. Um, in fact, earlier today I was, I was working on the Ruby module, uh, rewriting that to, to support Hira. Um, and the reason we're focusing on Hira here is, is this term we've come up with called uncomfortunities, um, which is basically the feeling that anyone has when they don't know Puppet and they're asked to edit Puppet code to make a change so they can update a version for something. 
Um, it's a giant uncomfortunity for them. Um, so we, we want to we, we want to uh, uh, avoid asking people to do that. Most people understand YAML or JSON. Um, so we're going to go ahead and focus on moving a lot of those things out to YAML and JSON based configuration uh, so that people don't have to look at public code if they don't want to, even though you might like them to. We're also going to be rolling out Ubuntu support this summer. Um, this is one of the, the biggest things that's been requested since Box has been OS X only since launch uh, because that's most of what GitHub uses. Um, Ubuntu support, it's, it's kind of it was a no-brainer. I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm a Debian guy myself, but most people this day and age are rolling Ubuntu if they're rolling Linux on the desktop. So uh, made sense to support that first, and that's going to start with Ubuntu precise support uh, only to start. Um, and from there, it'll be really easy for people to send PRs to uh, add support for existing distributions, since the code will already have been refactored to a lot of that. So what's coming from GitHub Puppet? Well, like I said, Ruby 193 is going to get rolled out everywhere for our infrastructure. Um, after that, probably focus on moving to 2.0 once 2.0 exceeds uh, sort of the performance of our patched Ruby 193. We're also going to be looking to move to Puppet 3x. Uh, again, it's a difficult move. Uh, if any of you have done it before, and you've run into all sorts of things like dynamic scoping warnings always uh, only being triggered on the master on the first time that resource is put in the catalog. It's a fun one. Um, in addition to that, environments being quite clean for all execs. Uh, there's a lot of implicit behavior that depends on uh, existing environments being in uh, the user's environment that, that's invoking Puppet. So a lot of challenges to tackle there, a lot of code to We're also going to be rolling out um, an ENC in the form of an internal application called gPanel. Um, gPanel already exists today. kind of looks like that. Um, and it's sort of our inventory store for everything application configuration, physical hardware, um, and we're going to be making that to an ENC as well. That'll be pretty interesting to see how that rolls out going <coughs> forward. We're also going to be adding M Collective into the mix. Um, we've rolled it out a little bit previously, but we haven't really utilized it. And the reason is that we've had this repository GitHub shell, which is, as you might expect, a bunch of bash scripts uh, along with SSH and a for loop. Um, it, it works, you know, uh, people laugh, but it, it works incredibly well. Um, but what it comes down to is that for a lot of things, we're dealing with structured data now. Um, and at the end of the day, structured data, um, it's going to beat set and every time. Uh, set and awk were made for, for a different sort of uh, uh, data, and it certainly wasn't Jason. Um, <laughs> So we're, we're going to be focusing a lot on uh, rolling and collected out as well. Hira, um, we're probably going to mix that in, in production as well. Um, part of that is going to be that we've uh, decided that we're going to put a concerted effort. Uh, almost all of our modules uh, in GitHub production right now are entirely closed source. Um, and as we've been going through and modernizing a lot of them, we've realized that a lot of people would really benefit from seeing these things, being able to use these things. For example, we have uh, as far as I know, the most robust uh, pacemaker module that exists. Um, it's it's kind of mind-blowing, the stuff that Project has done in there. Um, so we're going to be open sourcing a lot of those. And as part of that, to make it easier to configure, easier to use, easier to consume, we're going to be adding higher support to these things. So thank you very much. Um, slides are going to be up at that URL. Uh, they should be available already. Um, let's go ahead and open it for questions. I mean, just you guys want to know what we're doing with Puppet? Ask questions, yeah. Why do you go ahead and run everything uh, directly on OS X for public cards? Why not use virtual machines? Uh, so that one is uh, pretty pretty straightforward for us. Uh, what it came down to was that the additional overhead, uh, just in terms of thinking about the sort of interactions that you've already like internalized over years. For example, like designers being able to just save in Photoshop and refresh a page and have something automatically updated. Um, a lot of that was, was hard to sort of get implemented culturally. Uh, it increased friction, and that was kind of one of the big things with Boxing, is we determined that there was a lot of friction in developing new projects, or we uh, new projects we worked on before at GitHub, and uh, you know, we tried virtualization very early on, and we found it made people more frustrated rather than less. Uh, so that's why we ended up uh, focusing on doing everything local on the machine itself. Now that said, uh, we do run everything in a single prefix, and we provide a command to just uh, remove everything that Watson's done with the machine. Um, 
So it's, it's really not like it's going to just throw jump all over your file system. We're very careful about that. Um, in addition to that, we run all our services right now on uh, non-default ports and sockets. Uh, so if you're running uh, another instance of MySQL, or Postgres, what have you, uh, it won't con uh, conflict with those. Um, really, the only thing we conflict with uh, is RVM, uh, and that's because it does terrible things to your shell. You should be using RVM for CHRP anyway. Um, does that answer your question? Anyone else? Yeah. You went pretty fast through the point of the Git, um, of, of things over Git. Yeah. And I realized a lot of that was with Do you have a simple repository, you have, but what mechanism do you, do you set up the uh, single, a different public environment for each branch? Yeah, um, so the way that works is we have, uh, let me go ahead and go back here. We have these deploys, um, so with QWAP, you can deploy a single branch, which will, in the case that an environment does not exist, will update the shared Git repository on the uh, Puppet Master server, um, and it will go ahead and do a clone from local disk to create the new environment. Now, if that environment already exists, it'll just fast forward it to the head of that branch. Now, if you don't specify any environment, you just say deploy Puppet, it will do that for all branches. Um, so, in the case of deleted branches, it will clean up old environments automatically. In the case of new branches, it will create environments automatically. And in the case of existing ones, it will update environments automatically. Um, we're pretty happy with our branch deploy uh, infrastructure. Um, at least in my experience working at previous places uh, to get uh, most people were not, I think, using environments as, as much as they could have. Um, a lot of people, I think, pretty much had production and testing, uh, which is certainly one way to do it, but it makes rolling uh, with a larger team that's going to be submitting a large number of pull requests very difficult because you basically um, are in one of two scenarios wherein you're constantly fighting a breaking testing environment due to conflicting changes, uh, or you have to, to do a longer release cycle and, and all that mess. And, and you know, it doesn't really jive with the way we were to get up. Um, a lot of it's about very small, very rapid pull requests um, that aren't supposed to be long lived. So oftentimes, most of these branches won't live past a day or two. Um, for a lot of day to day work, you know, stuff that's going to take 15, 30 minutes to sling out, oftentimes less than a few hours. Um, in fact, we have Nagios configured such that if any node is running uh, the any non production environment for more than four hours, it generates a critical alert. That's how short lived most of these are intended to be when you're rolling them out on nodes. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Yeah. So I can please look at implementing QBot a little bit. Yeah. And uh, as I understand, there's no security around it, really. And if you're in the room, you have access to everything, right? Uh, sort of. Um, so there is a, a role system that we have uh, that's it's available in the QBot script repository. Um, and mostly what that adds in our case is uh, it, we check if a user is considered trusted. Um, and that's just a role added in the role list. Now that said, we're, we're not happy with the security model that, that exists in Ebot right now. Um, and we're putting a lot of effort on fixing that um, because we have this exact same concern. As we continue to grow, we have a lot of outside contractors coming in and stuff like that. And there's certain commands that absolutely they should not be able to run. Um, so it's, it's, you know, it's something we're working on. Ebot is an open source project uh, and, and we're working with uh, its maintainers outside of GitHub to, to find a way to implement this correctly. Um, I think it's going to land in uh, QBot 3, which is, it should be the next major version, because um, it requires some changes to the Brain API to make it work. Um, because the Brain API itself, the one that allows you to set roles, um, doesn't do any authentication on its own. Uh, so obviously that needs to be fixed first, because anyone can just set a role on someone else. Um, so it's actively on our radar. Uh, in the meantime, you know, we use Campfire for chat, but Ebot supports IRC, got chat, all that sort of stuff. Um, you know, thus far we've just kept contractors uh, kind of isolated to rooms that generally don't have Ebot in them, uh, which is not an ideal solution, but it's something that works in the interim and allows us to make sure that only trusted people are able to issue these sorts of commands. Yeah. So do you have multiple instances of Ebot for different environments, like? Dev stage and then production, so that people, QA people, for example, can access the QA dev QBot, or is it all just one? So we do have uh, multiple QBots. Uh, some of the rooms, for example, uh, the people that we have that work on core Git and work on LibGit too, um, they have their own QBot, and that QBot has access to a certain subset of repositories. 
So that Qbot is still able to deploy, for example, but only that particular application. Um, you know, we're, once once uh, a lot of this permission stuff gets rolled out into Qbot's for the chopper, that won't be necessary anymore. Uh, we'll be able to integrate it into our deployment service. Um, so Qbot, you know, by default doesn't include anything to like, do deploys for you. Um, Ours is we just have a very simple API wrapper for Capistrano, basically, uh, and Qbot just makes API requests for that. Um, so it's possible you might be able to do some authentication on that side as well. Um, you could probably keep a list on, on your deploy data side of, for example, um, all the teams and the users on those teams in uh, your GitHub organization. Uh, and basically have Qbot pass along the user requesting the deploy along with that and match them against that list and use that to do um, ACL at the deploying data side. Um, and then you can just return an error and have Qbot you know, spit something out if it receives that sort of error. Um, so I think it could be implemented today, but it's probably going to be more on your deploying data side and less on Qbot side. Yeah. Um, can you talk about why you guys chose to go masterless? I've always heard it's a performance boost to take the master of the equation, but it's a security risk because you're sending all of your modules down to all of your machines. Uh, so we're running masterless in the case of Boxin. Um, and in production, we're still running with the Puppet Master um, for, for GitHub.com. But in the case of Boxin, it was more just about um, ease of doing everything. Uh, it was a lot more intuitive for people um, to be able to just like test and edit locally and run it. Um, w with regards to Boxing, it wasn't anything to do with performance that made us decide that. Um, now that said, at previous jobs, I've definitely used uh, Masterlist for large production setups and I absolutely loved it. Um, we had a Capistrano based workflow there uh, that works pretty well. It's based on a tool called Rump uh, that was written by uh, Lindsay Holman. Um, we, we, we use that uh, across all of our servers. Um, I mean, there are security risks, you know. Um, in addition to that, there's certain industries where you actually can't uh, run all that code locally uh, on the agent or, or on the individual node. Um, for example, like banking and stuff like that. They have all sorts of policies around like what uh, boxes can actually run code versus like you apply a change set um, that are kind of two degree arbitrary. But yeah, there's a security risk, but there is a speed of improvement as well. Um, like you mentioned, uh, mostly uh, config retrieval times are often a lot shorter. Now that said, you also don't have access to things like exported resources necessarily um, when you're running masterless stuff. And exported resources are incredibly useful in a lot of cases. I mentioned monitoring, for example, um, being able to define your monitoring alongside the, the things that are being monitored, right? So your Redis monitoring can be implemented in the Redis module rather than having a giant class that collects all of your monitoring for all of the different things that applies on the one monitoring box which can sometimes be not only hard to maintain, but hard to ensure that you're actually uh, rolling out all the necessary monitoring for each individual service that you're running, right? Um, does that answer? Uh, okay. Cool. No one else? Uh, yeah, what's up? So your the modules and boxes, you said you were adding higher support in, is that targeting 3.0 and data bindings, or will you be using parser functions? Uh, so that's all uh, data bindings, all of it, um, because uh, Boxen since launch actually has been all 3.0 plus, so it's going to be all data binding driven. Um, so there's a pull request you can actually see open on the movie module right now where it's just like, uh, I think there's a handful of parameters. And we're actually using um, some of the techniques I talked about with data munching. So for example, uh, with the, the Ruby module, you can, you can pass a list of um, plugins for RBM. We're using RBM. You can pass a list of plugins, and that's actually a hash that ends up getting passed on to create resource. Um, that allows you to effectively override uh, the modules, uh, sorry, the plugins that you're going to use with RBM, not only specifying uh, like things like versions and stuff like that. Um, you know, I'm pretty happy with it so far. There's certainly a few edge cases, um, but you know, it's it's pretty clear why they exist. Um, so you know, we've been really happy with it thus far, and, and data bindings have, have been uh, really convenient for when that stuff out. Um, yeah. Thanks, Rock. All right. Yeah. Talk about what else you're using PuppetDB for besides exported resources. Um. So PuppetDB, we also use it um, for node expiry sort of problems, right? Um. So for example, if we decommission a node, being able to invoke an API call to make sure it's removed from the exported resources list that is used to populate objects is often a big one because previously. 
it would basically be, well, if you didn't remember to silence the server in Nagios before decommissioning it, it would go critical, and it'd be critical for you know several days until Puppet was eventually like, oh, it's really not around anymore. Um, beyond that, I mean, PuppetDB, there's, there's certainly other uses you can have for it. I mentioned um, being able to query against the reports. Um, so for sort of uh, doing audit analysis, um, it's very useful. Um, Postmortems, it's also incredibly useful. You can uh, ask PuppetDB, show me all of the reports where like service Apache was restarted or this config file change and that sort of thing. Um, and that includes uh, sort of timestamps as to when it happened. Uh, and that's pretty useful for us auditing why um, certain things failed uh, previously. Um, beyond that, I mean, PuppetDB tries to keep it pretty simple. It's not a full inventory service or anything like that. Uh, it's mostly targeted at collecting information about uh, your nodes, uh, your compiled catalogs, um, export resources, that sort of thing. Uh, I guess, yeah, the other thing I should have mentioned is it does uh, efficient catalog caching. Um, and I believe it might even support now some sub-catalog caching so that parts of the catalog can be cached, which obviously increases your catalog compilation times, or sorry, decreases your catalog compilation times. Um, through that caching mechanism, uh, which of course means that you have faster puppet runs across all of the nodes. So do you have a separate uh, catalog terminus that does that? Uh, there's a PuppetDB terminus that's included with uh, a PuppetDB app. Uh, you just set that as your catalog terminus. Um, it also does some caching of facts, as I recall. Um, so it allows you to get a lot of the uh, querying behavior that you can see in, for example, M Collective. Uh, to be able to query arbitrary uh, nodes uh, based upon fact values, but without having to have collective roll out on your infrastructure. Um, so that's also pretty nice too. Uh, you can do things like show me all the nodes that have uh, this class uh, in their catalogs, that sort of thing. Um, it's, it's very handy for a lot of those sorts of lookups. Uh, it's you know, PuppetDB is, is is really useful. It's going to speed a lot of things up for you, especially if you're doing export resources. Uh, but beyond that, it's just a, a really nice layer to build. Um, other services on top of it, you know, treat it as an API and, and really consume it. Um, there's pretty extensive documentation on the Puppet Labs website about the API endpoints that it supports. Um, you can do a lot of really robust querying. Um, it makes rolling out upgrades for a lot of things easier. You know, the, the query stuff I mentioned, you can do things like uh, show me, you know, give me all nodes that have uh, this package version within these version constraints. <coughs> Uh, and we were going to go ahead and uh, from there use that list and like stop puppet, upgrade the package, start puppet, that sort of thing. Um, oftentimes used for testing rollouts, like we need to roll out a new Git version on file servers. We can do that pretty effectively using uh, PuppetDB API to pull back into the list that way. Um, anything else? All right, cool. Thank you guys for your time.